certainly appreciate everyone uh, <clears throat> in attendance for this class. I'm still on the topic of uh, logic in the Bible. Getting close to the end, probably uh, done with before the summer's over with. <clears throat> But uh, then, we, but we'll continue some things about logic for some time after that. But it won't be so uh, <clears throat> involved as we have uh, been engaged in for the past several months. Before we start, though, let's uh, have a short word of prayer. If you'd bow with me, please. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for this time of study, or any time of study that we can dwell upon thy word and, and what you would have us to do. We know the time is short. Father, we know that this country is um, in turmoil and morality is no longer in vogue. We know that uh, virtue is condemned and uh, uh, those things that are evil are upheld. Whether that be the case or not, we know that it is thy word that sustains us, that will save us, and we thank thee for the gospel, for its power to save. And may we ever be studious of what it has for us, for we know that therein is salvation to be found. And we thank thee for Jesus, who, while we were yet sinners, and beyond our own capability, he died for us that through his blood we might have remission of sins. All these things we ask in his name. Amen. I think uh, what I'm going to do is, uh, if you, uh, you, you know, Nancy prints out all these lessons, but uh, you, you may just be looking at the screen here, this uh, shared uh, screen here. But I want to go back over this uh, immediate inferences, even though I've gone over, uh, I guess, last week. So just so that we uh, have a good understanding of what we're talking about. And, and, and I would admit that logic is not an easy topic for most people. Formal logic is not an easy topic for most people to gather, but it is useful. It is useful. So, so let's look at... Uh, the immediate inferences. And, you know, most of the arguments that we engage in in daily life um, are not just, they're just uh, expressed in normal everyday talking. We don't um, make it into a stilted uh, standard categorical form. So, uh, in order to make the skills uh, hopefully here to, to for more practical we will consider how to translate a argument in normal english you know the things that we just do every day into standard syllogisms we first look at uh, translation from immediate inferences and of course, uh, you know, logic, you know, a lot of things we do is, is has to do with inferences. What does one thing imply about another? So an immediate uh, inference is a statement that can be inferred directly from another statement. It resembles a syllogism, you know, the syllogism, major premise, minor premise, and conclusion. But it resembles a syllogism with only one premise, and uh, it's related to the concepts of implication and the equivalence. We've already mentioned a number of inferences in our lessons, and if you recall from the square of opposition, we know that sum S is P, and that uh, I statement can be immediately inferred from all SSP, that's the A statement, by sub-implication. If you follow that square of, of uh, opposition, you can follow that sub-implication down. We uh, also know that uh, by our study that 
on logical equivalence, you may want to refer, refer to that, that the following statements can be immediately inferred from each other. And no S is P, there is not one S in the whole category of P, not one. So if that's the case, then there can be no P's that are S. That can be inferred from that. No S is in P, uh, no S is P implies that no P is S. Now if we say some S is P, you can have, let's think of P as a big broad category and some of those in that category are S's. Well, if that's the case, then we can infer that some P, that big broad category of which some are S, we can say that some P is S. So the uh, immediate inference that switches the subject and the predicate of a statement is called a converse. And you don't have to you know, commit this to memory, but the converse is only valid for E, that is, no S is P and I, some S is P. So the A statements, all S is P, and the O statements, some S is not P, do not have a valid converse. All S and P does not imply, and we're talking about implication here, does not imply that all P is F, S. And if that were the case, uh, we could say that, you know, the statement all women are people, if we were to, if it did have a valid converse, that would imply that all people are women. Well, we know that's not true, so it doesn't have a converse. Similarly, some dogs are not poodles, does not mean that some poodles are not dogs. So some things just don't have a converse, those uh, uh, A and uh, O statements. Another type of immediate inference is the obverse. The obverse of a statement is obtained by changing the quality of the statement. All changes to no, some to some not, and so forth in changing the predicate to its complement, P to non-P. Each of the four categorical statements has a valid obverse. They are translated as follows. All S is P can be the same as no S is non-P. So you made uh, both of them, uh, originally both of them were positive and you change both of them to negative. So we could say that all believers are Christians. That's equivalent to no believers are non-Christians. And another one is no S is P is all S is non-P. Thus, no demons are atheists. They all know that God exists. No demons are atheists means the same as all demons are non-atheists. So we can say that uh, some S is P, and we can say that some S is not non-P. And if you you know you look at it, this just different word wording of the same thought. So we could say that some incredible things are possible. That implies that some incredible things are not impossible. And finally, we can say that some S is not P, and some S is non-P, and we just change not to non. And uh, this is, uh, of course, more obvious. Some Americans are not capitalists, is equivalent to 
some Americans are non-capitalist. The third type of immediate inference is the contrapositive. The contrapositive switches the subject and the predicate of A, all S is P, and O, some S is not P, statements as uh, converse statements, but it changes both the uh, subject and predicate of each to their complements. And this can, can be derived from the other two immediate inferences. So follow the uh, two translations as presented below, but before I get into that, you see that uh, second by obverse, you got a green line under it. That should be by converse. <clears throat> so whoever typed this typed it wrong. So all S is P by obverse, no S is non-P. By converse, no non-S is P. And that by obverse, no non -S, non P is S, and you go through the or non S, you can go through the same. Uh, the scenario on the right hand side of the uh, page. Thus, uh, we could say that uh, the statement, all say people are believers, is equivalent to all non believers are unsaved people. Similarly, some faithful people are not Buddhist translates to as contrapositive, some not non-Buddhist are not faithful people. And you'll note that the uh, contrapositive is not valid for E statements, uh, no S is B, and you can work through that to see that. In I statements, some S is not P statements. It can be proved by trying to put either type of statement through the translation uh, procedure set forth above and just try it. After the first obverse, the statement is obtained that has no valid converse. All non-believers are unsaved people and no believers are non-Christians. Therefore, all Christians are saved people. <clears throat> so is that valid or invalid? As uh, written, this argument has uh, six terms, not six, six terms. It has saved people, unsaved people, Christians, non-Christians, believers, and non-believers. It also looks as if it has a negative premise and an affirmative conclusion. In order to analyze it for validity, the number of terms needs to be reduced down to the standard three using the immediate inferences. So the major premise is a is an A statement, all S is P. And uh, we can take this, uh, we can take its contrapositive and change it into all saved people are believers. And up here we had uh, um, all non-believers are unsaved people. We just had the, the contrapositive, all saved people are believers. Then all Christians are believers. Uh, that becomes a minor premise. Yes, the whole argument becomes all saved people are believers. All Christians are believers. Therefore, all Christians are saved people. Now, this uh, argument can be analyzed by the techniques uh, that we've already covered. And this is a a A A dash four syllogism. And you need to go back and look at the mood and figure lessons to know what a, a four syllogism is. 
but that's an invalid uh, syllogism since he had, has a illicit a minor term. So it's not a valid uh, statement. So let's look at, the, let me make this one a little larger. Translating uh, ordinary statements. So categorical statements uh, have here been expressed in very formal language. In everyday arguments, just normal conversation, uh, they can be expressed in a wide variety of ways. Uh, we have heretofore translated some ordinary statements into categorical form, but there are many more means of expressing statements that uh, we need, really need to consider. For example, we have learned that a categorical form requires verbs to be changed into nouns. Thus, the ordinary statement, all roads lead to Rome, becomes all roads are to Rome leaders, or all roads are roads that lead to Rome. Similarly, we have seen that uh, for proper categorical form, adjectives must be, become nouns. All roads are ugly is not in categorical form. All toads, rather, are ugly is not in categorical form. It uh, must be translated in something like uh, all toads are ugly amphibians. The exercise of translating requires the recognition of some synonyms to the words all, no, and some. So let's think about uh, some examples. All, and you may be able to think of some others too. All could be every, any, as many as, and so forth. No could be all, not, or never. And some could be many, most, a few, and so forth. And these are not exhaustive uh, uh, examples. Like I say, you can come up with some on your own. So note that statements of the form, not all S or P, should be translated some S or not P because the contradiction, if you look at the square of opposition, the contradiction of an A statement, all S or P, is a no statement, some S or not P. So uh, statements of the form, not all S or P should be translated some S or not P, not no S is P. Thus not all students are bad means some students are not bad people. Let's look at uh, singular statements. These are some additional statements in ordinary English. Uh, that we need to take a look at. Statements often refer to a single person or thing. Uh, when this is the case, it usually is best to translate them as universals. This they would be changed like this. John is a mailman. And this is may, maybe a little awkward, but it uh, fits better with uh, analyzing these things. We can say all John, everything that is John, all John is a mailman. So singular statements that are denials are translated in the same way. For example, you are not my people. That's why we normally express things. But if you want to put it in a uh, uh, categorical statement form, you'd say, no, you or my people, not any of you or my people. 
and I know this sounds awkward, you know, we don't talk like this uh, normally, <clears throat> and unless you're a Jedi master, but it will allow for ease and analyzing arguments. Now in indefinite statements, so some statements look uh, very similar to singular statements, but the context requires them to be translated differently. For example, considering the following sentence. Dogs ate my homework. I know you teachers have heard that probably. Dogs ate my homework. This uh, statement should not be translated all dogs were eaters of my homework, since no doubt only a, a few dogs were involved. It is a better change to some dogs were eater, eaters of my homework. <clears throat> and it can be just one dog, that's some. So translating indefinite statements requires the student to think about the meaning of the statements in the argument. So let's uh, consider this argument. Cats are mammals. Cats sang outside my window. Therefore, mammals sang outside my windows. The first statement should be translated into a universal. All cats are mammals. The second statement, however, should be translated into the particular. Some cats were outside my window singers. The conclusion would be then some mammals are outside my window singers. <clears throat> and that would be a, a true statement if the premises are true. Let's look at hypothetical statements. Uh, many statements use the, or similar words, if then language, uh, which we'll consider in more detail in a, in a later lesson, but we'll go over it briefly to here. For now, we can just say that uh, such statements can be translated into universal, such as, if you like chocolate, you will love this cake. And we translate that into all chocolate likers will be lovers of this cake. Similarly, uh, negative hypotheticals can be translated into E statements, such as if it's a hard test, then I won't pass. <clears throat> In the uh, E statement, no hard test is a test that I will pass. And uh, we'll run across these again when we look at the more difficult uh, translations. So let's look at the uh, next size here. And I've already uh, answered these for you. So we want to translate the following, following statements in normal English into standard categorical form. And of course, the translations is, is in italic. God is good, we, can, we would translate that to all God is a good being. Uh, two, as many are as led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. And we would translate that in standard, standard categorical form to say all people led by the Spirit of God or sons of God. And number three, if you sin, you are a lawbreaker. <clears throat> and we would uh, translate that all sinners are lawbreakers. And four, not everybody uh, will come. And we could uh, translate that some people are not people who will come. And number uh, five, a soft answer turns away wrath. And we would translate that to all soft answers 
or RAF deflectors. Six, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And we could translate that into no lovers of the world or people with the love of the Father. And number seven, many antichrists have come. And we would translate that some, are, some antichrists have been comers. Eight, I believe. Translate that to all I am uh, a believer. All I am a believer. Number nine, the Pharisee sit in Moses' seat. We translate that to all the Pharisees are in Moses' seat sitters. And then number 10, the love of most will grow cold. And some love will be cold love. And like I say, most of the time uh, when you're talking about just ordinary statements, you don't have to translate it because the uh, um, one you're conversing with knows quite well what you're talking about. So you don't have to do that. But if you're trying to analyze statements, especially in the debate, you've got to put it in a form that can be uh, put in one of these categorical statements, A, E, I, or O, so you can know uh, what is uh, valid and what is not valid. <clears throat> so let's look at uh, translating, translating inclusive and exclusive statements. <clears throat> and there are two more broad types of statements in ordinary English that require translation into standard form. Uh, those, those are statements that uh, employ what we just might call inclusive and exclusive. So uh, number one, inclusive. Some statements employ what are called inclusive words. Now, the words in this category are often uh, relative pronouns and adverbs. They're related to each other. So they all have this the function of including a broad, uh, unspecified range of things or times in the meaning of the sentence. So examples are words such as whoever, whatever, wherever, whenever, however, always, never, and other similar words. You can come up with other words. Uh, some, uh, you know, you might, we might refer to these as ever words. And uh, give a few examples here. Uh, let's think about how the following sentence uh, would be translated. You should eat whatever your mother feeds you. <clears throat> and I might add that I ate whatever my mother fed me, whether I liked it or not. <clears throat> And most of it alike. The function of the word whatever here is to include every type of food your mother might feed you. So it, it is best translated all things. So the following, the words following, the inclusive word usually make up the subject. And so the remainder of the statement becomes the, the predicate, as in the following. Uh, translation. You should eat whatever your mother feeds you. All things your mother feeds you are things you should eat. Let's consider this use of the inclusive word whenever. Whenever two or more of you are gathered in my name, there I shall be in the midst of you. Now, depending on the rest of the argument, this can be translated in terms of time or place. We can translate it as all times that two or more of you are gathered in my name or times I will be in the midst of you. And we must take uh, 
care with time inclusive, which is always, and sometimes the translation is easy. The poor you will have always with you, or you will always have with you. In all times or times, the poor will be with you. But uh, consider the translation of this statement. Jill always wins at chess. This should not be translated all times or times Joe wins at chess because sometimes Joe is not playing chess. It is best to translate it this way. All times Joe plays chess or times times Joe's Joe wins at chess. And uh, never should be uh, treated similarly. Note that uh, though it is negative, it still refers inclusively to all times, just uh, as an E statement uh, distributes the ter its terms. <clears throat> Sometimes uh, shorter versions of ever words are used. Uh, they should be translated in the same way as their longer counterparts. In the following example, the word where acts like the word wherever. I will go where you go. All places you go are places I will go. Notice that even the word that can be used as an, as an exclusive. Now take this statement, for example, all's well that ends well. Here the word that has the same function as uh, whatever. So this is best translated as follows. All things that end well are things that are well. In exclusives, words that exclude, such as only, unless, and except. And again, you can come up with uh, additional ones require special attention as well. The exclusive set boundaries by explicitly referring to a limited class of things. Although they may seem opposite to inclusive, they are still usually translated as universals, often affirmative. And let's consider this statement, only the good die young. What is the categorical form of this uh, statement? It could be translated, all good people are people who die young. But that's not the meaning of the statement any more than only women are mothers means that all women are mothers. This statement is really as follows, all people who die young are good people. The words nobody but or nothing but, and so on, are all translated in the same way. For example, nobody but the Spartans could fight like that. And we can translate that to all people who could fight like that are the Spartans. Now, let's consider this statement. <clears throat> the plants will die unless you water them. This does not mean that all the plants you water are plants that do not die. The above statement could still be true, but if you faithfully water the plant, still it's, it's going to eventually die. Uh, rather, the statement uh, should become all the plants you do not water are the plants that die, or the contrapositive. All the plants that do not die are the plants that you water. Finally, the word except must be considered. Statements that employ except often contain two independent statements, which both should be considered. For example, everyone was invited to the clubhouse except sisters. <clears throat> This clearly includes the statement, 
all nine sisters were clubhouse invited people. But it just as clearly includes the meaning of no sisters were clubhouse invited people. Which translation should be used depends on, depends on how the statement is used in the argument. Obviously, the translation of arguments use, using the type of statements in these last two sections requires some careful consideration and some practice. You have to practice at it. Often, the best approach is simply to ask, what does this statement really mean? If the meaning can be correctly carried across the, into the statements in categorical form, then the arguments uh, can be examined for validity. And let's look at some exercise here. So let's translate the following statements uh, that are in, in normal English into standard categorical form. Number one, wherever you go, there you are. And we could translate that to all places you go or places you are. Number two, you may prepare it however you like. And we translate that all ways you like to prepare it or ways you may prepare it. Number three, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Translate that to all non-repenters will be perishers. Number four, he never did anything wrong. We can translate that to no times or times he did wrong. Number five, you will reap what you sow. We can translate that to all things you sow are things that you will reap. Number six, he gets sick whenever he drinks milk. Translate that to all time he drinks milk or times he gets sick. And number seven, righteousness is found only in the Lord. We can translate that all righteousness is a thing found in the Lord. Number eight, God does whatever he pleases. We translate that to all things he pleases or things God does, things God does. Number nine, you always hurt the one you love. All people you love are people you hurt. Number 10, nobody leaves except those who have finished. Translate that to all leavers are finishers. Now, we must admit that the uh, common English uh, form sounds a whole lot better. But again, if you're trying to analyze these things logically, it's very helpful, helpful to put these in standard uh, syllogistic or categorical form. And um, you, you certainly if you're in a debate, you want to do that. So let's have, have another exercise here. So let's translate the following into standard categorical form. Happy is the land that has no history, and King Frank's land has no history. We must conclude that King Frank's land is happy. We can change that to all lands without history or happy lands. And all King Frank's land is a land without history. Therefore, all King Frank's land is a happy land land. Now, can you guess from this what the middle term is? But it's history, because history is not in the conclusion. Number two, none but the wise are truly happy. So Solomon was happy since he was so wise. And we can translate that to all truly happy people or wise people. All Solomon was a wise person. Therefore, all Solomon was a truly happy person.
Again, why ask people is the middle terms since it's not in the conclusion. Number three, some people are not Christ's disciples or whoever turns away cannot be his disciple. And many people turn away. So we can change that into <clears throat> no people who turn away are Christ's disciples. And some people are people who turn away. Therefore, some people are not Christ's disciples. And for all sciences except logic, study the tangible, and chemistry is not logic. This chemistry is a study of the tangible. We change that to all non logic sciences or tangible studies. All chemistry is a non-logic science. Therefore, all chemistry is a tangible study. <clears throat> and we'll, <clears throat> we'll consider for a while if the Rith means uh, or in in means in the means. Yeah, we, we, I doubt that you've ever run across this word enthamine, but, but it's uh, something we use in, in our everyday conversation. <clears throat> you know, like I say, we use logic uh, in our normal conversations, however, <clears throat> we rare it in, it's just not necessary to uh, put our logical arguments into standard form syllogisms. Just not necessary in casual conversations. And to do so would uh, limit the natural flow of such conversations. So premises and sometimes conclusions are often omitted from casual conversation. But they are nevertheless assumed. Arguments, uh, syllogistically speaking, in which a statement that is premises or conclusions in which a statement is unstated is called a enthymeme, mean enthymeme. That's uh, from the Greek uh, to keep in mind. We have in mind what it is, we just don't state what it is. So here's an enthymeme that uh, you might hear in everyday conversation. You aren't invited to the baby shower because only women are invited. <clears throat> I wish. <clears throat> First, we locate the conclusion. In this argument, the conclusion is the first statement. You aren't invited to the baby shower. So translating this into a categorical form gives us no you or invited persons. Let's look at the other statement. Only women are invited. So we put this in the standard form. We have all invited persons are women. So we see that the major term invited persons, this has a major, major term invited persons. So it is the major premise. So put this into uh, its proper order and leaving space for the missing premise we have all invited persons are women. There therefore no you or invited persons. Now the three little dots just a just a shorthand for therefore. So when you see those three little dots in kind of a little pyramid, that means therefore. Therefore no you or invited persons. The missing premise must contain the terms that have been used only once. In this case, you and women. If the person is arguing badly, <clears throat> the missing premise must also be an E statement. Since an E statement is equivalent to its converse, it doesn't matter in what order the terms are placed. <clears throat> 
this, the missing premise would be no you are women. And the complete uh, syllogism uh, would then be all invited persons are women, no you are women, therefore no you are invited persons. Like I say, it's not really necessary normal conversation to go through this process. But it is useful for when you get into a, a formal logical discussion, if you want to really nail down what uh, the other people person is saying. The enthymine uh, has thus been translated into categorical form with the assumed premise set in uh, parentheses. It's a, an A8 AEE-2 syllogism. And again, you need to look at the uh, lesson on mood and figure of syllogisms. The figure two is a major premise is P is M and minor premise is S is, S is M. Let's consider another example uh, taken from the Bible. In Matthew, the 27th chapter, verse four, Judas said, I have sinned by betraying infant blood. What was Judas assuming in this hint to me? Uh, first, we put the conclusion, I have sinned in the categorical form. All I am, a sinner. So the given premise uh, contains the minor term, I, so it is the minor premise. We put that into categorical form and we obtain the following. All I am an innocent blood betrayer. So what is the assumed premise? It is the major premise and must contain both the middle term innocent blood betrayer and the uh, major term sinner. So we should assume that he was making a valid argument if we can. If so, the only valid syllogism that ends in a universal affirmative is an AAA-1 uh, statement. A's are, of course, universal affirmatives. And figure one is the major premise is M. Uh, major premise M is P. And the minor premise S is M. So the minor term is the predicate and the uh, subject is the middle term. Thus, the complete argument is all innocent blood betrayers are sinners. All I am, all I am an innocent blood betrayer. You know, I could almost say all that I, that I, that I am is an instant blood betrayer, but <clears throat> all I am an instant blood betrayer. Therefore, all I am a sinner. So let's uh, do one more example. Um, I think that's Matthew 10, chapter verse uh, 40. And when we get uh, finished this, we'll be concluded for the night. We'll conclude for the night. He who receives you receive me, and he who receives me receive him who sent me. So if we place the premises in categorical form in the proper order, we obtain all receivers of me are receivers of him who sent me. All receivers of you are receivers of me. Therefore, what's the conclusion? Uh, obviously, Jesus wishes to conclude that he who receives you receives him who sent me. And we can translate this into proper form and place it in the syllogism, thereby obtaining the final product. All receivers of me are receivers of him who sent me. And all receivers of you are receivers of me. Therefore, all receivers of you are receivers of him who sent me. 
So uh, we're a little bit over time, but so we, we'll conclude there and, and uh, you know, uh, it's going to take some time to go back over these and really get it formulated in your mind uh, as to exactly what it's doing. But, you know, you go through this exercise and you can take a various statements of the Bible and go through this exercise and put it in a standard categorical form. And then you can see whether it's true or, or false. So thank you for your attendance, and we will take it up again next week.